Welcome back to the learning sessions on Embedded Linux. In the last session, uh, we have discussed about how do we create a process using various uh, system calls like fork, vfork, and clone. In this uh, session, let us continue our discussion about inter process communication. That is, we shall learn how do we establish communication between two or more processes. When we are implementing a project by creating a more than one process, definitely these processes which are part of a single project requires some kind of communication between one another. Linux offers a different uh, ways of establishing communication between this process. Let's have a look at uh, some of them in this uh, session. Uh, Inter-process communication has uh, three main components, namely the data, what you want to share between two or more processes and a mechanism to inform a process that the data is available now for accessing purpose. At the same time, we should also have certain mechanism to prevent the tasks or the processes from interferences. When one is using data, sometimes we should not allow other process to access the same data. Say for example, uh, if you look back your ADC programming, we wanted to read data from an ADC, take some calibration work, perform some calibration work, and then based on the data what you have received, I want to take an action. Instead of defining all those things in one single program, yeah, we can think of uh, having a multiple process. One process will do, do a job of read data, calibrate it and write into some IPC. Some other process will read the calibrated data and will take actions. Likewise, I have a process which will read data from an IO port. The data whatever I have read, I will hand over to one more fellow who should do the job of processing on that data. Or I have a fingerprint scanner, I want to read, the, I want to scan the fingerprint of a person who is using it now. Let me have one process who will scan the fingerprint. Let me have another process which, which will perform the operation on the data being scanned. Like this, we have plenty of applications where one process need to communicate with some other process. In Linux, we have different ways of implementing IPC. So Linux uh, provides uh, IPC mechanisms like pipes, message queues, shared memories, SEMA4, signals, files, sockets. Yeah, we have plenty of IPC mechanism. You will uh, not be able to cover up all these IPCs on a single day. Let's take up a few in one session, few in next uh, session, likewise and so on. So in this uh, session today, let us understand how do we implement pipes and message queues. We use the term pipe when we connect a data flow from one process to other process. Look at normal pipe, I have a water pipe. Yeah, we use a water pipe to make the water to flow from one place to other place. Electrical pipe, again, electrical wires are gonna be fed from one place to another place, one end to another end. Likewise, in programming, we use the term pipe whenever a data flow is gonna happen from one process to other process. In Linux, uh, so far, 
we are familiar with a pipe uh, which is of uh, this type which was used to link various shell commands command 1 and command 2 are linked using this for example ls pipe symbol more which was used to get data page by page likewise echo for example echo hello is going to print hello on the screen i'm just linking that with cat arrow operator test which is used to create a file here the output of echo command is fed as an input for this cat command instead of printing hello on the screen together these commands will store hello into a file by name test so if i just print it cat right arrow test it is going to it should be cat left arrow test or just cat test it will print me hello on the screen so here we use this uh, pipe uh, vertical line to pass the output of one command as input for the next command apart from this linux has got support for two different types of pipes namely unnamed pipes and named pipes as the name states named pipes are pipes which has been assigned with some name unnamed pipes are pipes which doesn't have any name being assigned to it unnamed pipes in simple words are referred as pipes whereas named pipes in simple terms are referred as FIFOs let's first uh, have a look at uh, named pipes are also referred as FIFOs as I said you a uh, FIFO is a named file which means it's a named pipe which means it's a pipe having some name and again in Linux we said each and every information on Linux is stored in the form of a file so pipes are also going to be implemented using a file but it is referred as a special type of file which allows unrelated as well as related process to communicate between each other but usually FIFOs are used to establish communication between two or more unrelated process. FIFOs are best suited for implementing client server kind of application. Please note while working with a FIFO you will not be able to operate both read and write operations at the same time you'll be able to either perform a read only operation or write only operation at a time we will not be able to perform both read and write operations another note the maximum size of data what we can store within a FIFO is limited to 4 kilobytes So we can uh, create this uh, FIFOs at the command prompt or within our programs. To create at the command prompt we use a, a command called as mkfifo is a shell command used to create the FIFO. I am just giving the name of the FIFO. Whatever name you wish you could assign. Then I am calling a echo and some welcome to ism as you know echo will print instead of printing I am just uh, redirecting I will just redirect this output to a file let me use a, a right arrow here which is used to redirect into a file by name slash home slash user slash temp slash my FIFO I am just giving the absolute path of the FIFO file this is one way Another way of creating the FIFO is uh, within our program by using a function called by name mkfifo, make FIFO. Just pass the 
name of the FIFO file and the permissions on this particular FIFO file. Whatever you wish, you can set. As I was uh, referring you just right now that on a FIFO at a given time, we can perform a read-only operation or write-only operation. So while opening the pipe, just pass the pipe name as an argument and permission, it could be a mode, it could be either read-only or write-only. So here uh, within the Linux kernel, by default, if at all you are trying to read from a pipe which doesn't have any data or in simple words, if you read from a empty pipe, by default, your process will be blocked. Your process will be put into pending state. Your process will be made to wait until it gets the data. Likewise, if you are performing a write operation on a pipe which is full, a pipe having 4K, on such pipes, if you write data, again, as there is no space to write data, by default, Linux will block that process. So if you want the, if you want to perform read or write operations without being blocked, then while opening the file, either in read only or write only mode, or that particular option with O underscore non-block. So that if you are able to perform read or write, it will perform. Otherwise, it returns error. Read function or write function would return error instead of making your process pending. So on the FIFO, you can either perform blocked operations or non-blocking operations. As usual, to read or write data on the pipe, uh, we could use a read or write function. So far uh, earlier, we have used this uh, read or write function to operate on the file instead of a normal file. Here we open a special file which, we, which will return a file descriptor. Using that file descriptor, we could use a read or write by invoking read or write functions. Let us look at a small sample program. Here I am just uh, creating a FIFO and writing some data into that particular FIFO. To create the FIFO, I am calling a MK FIFO. FIFO name, the FIFO name is a slash temp slash my underscore FIFO. The permissions are the mode I have given here 777. Then I'm opening the FIFO file, uh, whatever you have created earlier, in write-only mode and non-block operation. I'm asking the user to enter data. User will enter some data, which will be stored in a buffer by name buffer. The data, whatever user has entered, I'm writing into an I.O. device, which is pointed by PID, which is the return value of open function call. So in this case, whatever data user enters will be written into a FIFO. Now after this, you can just cat, cat slash temp slash my FIFO should give the data whatever is being recorded here. Otherwise, you can also uh, write a small code in the same program which will open the same FIFO once again in read-only mode. Perform read operation, print the red data. When you run this particular code, it will ask you enter data, whatever data you wish you could enter it, which will be written into the FIFO. Then I am reading the same and I am going to print whatever I have read. But writing and reading the data to the FIFO within a single program is meaningless. Because if I, were, if I am using within a single program, I could have done that with a simple array itself. The intention is not to use FIFOs within a single process. We have written this program just to understand 
how FIFOS works. Otherwise, in reality, we're going to have few processes which performs a right operation on the FIFO. We're going to have few more processes which are going to perform a read operation on the same FIFO. Coming to another type of pipe, as we said, are unnamed pipes. As the name states, here pipes doesn't have any name. So these uh, pipes are more easier to create and manage compared to a FIFO because here we use this uh, within a single program to establish communication between related processes. It is used only on related process. What do we mean by a related process? So within a, a Linux program, we have called a fork, which creates a child process. So between a parent and child, if you want to establish communication, here we can think of using this pipes. You have two separate program, A.C and B.C, having a main each. You compile and run them separately. It's two different processes which doesn't have any relationship. Between this process, if you want to establish communication, we make use of this FIFOs. FIFOs are used between unrelated process. Pipes are used to establish communication between related process. To create a, such an unnamed pipe, we use a function called by name a pipe where we pass an array of a size integer, array of integer of size 2 as its argument. This pipe will internally create a, a dummy file or a temporary file which is going to act like a FIFO. That FIFO will be opened uh, twice, one in uh, read only mode once in write only mode. So we get uh, two file descriptors. Internally, pipe function will create one temporary file and that file will be opened twice. Once in read only mode, once in write only mode. So we get two file descriptors. These two file descriptors will be stored in the array, whatever is passed as an argument. So pipe command returns two file descriptors, one for read operation, one for write operation in the array what is passed as an argument. Internally, this pipes doesn't have any user mode process synchronization facility. What does this mean? Yeah, synchronization is a facility which allows you to make a process to perform an operation on an event. That is, whenever you write data into a pipe, you cannot make a specific process to become ready to read. So here, whatever data you write, any child process could read. So anybody could write, anybody could read the data, whatever is written into this particular pipe. There is no explicit or implicit synchronization mechanism. If you would like to synchronize, yeah, we have to explicitly synchronize on this pipes. By using this particular pipes, we will be able to implement the same functionality what we saw earlier. We can make or we can write a code such that output of one program can be fed as an input for another program. Parent will perform some operation, his results can be given to child. Child will perform some other operation or vice versa. Child will perform some specific operation, return some values to parent. Parent can again perform some operation, again write data. Likewise, parent and child can communicate a number of times. Please note, we cannot use these pipes between two unrelated processes.
if you are writing uh, multiple data before somebody reads that data the data are going to be sent in first in first out manner the data what you write first will be the data which comes out of the fifo first this is what i was uh, referring you a function call called as a pipe is used to create a pipe the argument should be an integer array so we are supposed to declare one array of size integer 2 and pass array name as an argument for this pipe function call internally this function call will create one temporary pipe open that uh, temporary pipe file two times one in read only mode and one in once in write only mode the read end of this file descriptor will be stored in the first element of the array first element of the array is going to hold the file descriptor which internally it points to the read only operation on the pipe another uh, file descriptor which was obtained by opening the temporary fifo in write only mode will be the second element of this descriptor array for example the descriptor array would be having a number 3 and 4 if none of the files is being opened in your system because on linux system standard input stream is using file descriptor 0 standard output stream uses file descriptor 1 standard error stream will use file descriptor 2 these three descriptors are open by default so within your system if you are not open any file the file descriptor numbers will be assigned as 3 and 4 otherwise it could be any number any number could be assigned but will be assigned contiguously so if read end is 10 write end will be 11 and so on So the number what it gets printed would be different based on how many files is being opened in your system. To just get to know the descriptors, uh, I could write a small code like this. Just create one array of uh, integer of size 2. Call pipe by passing that array as an argument. And I am printing after this the read uh, uh, descriptor n and write descriptor n. So there will be consecutive numbers. As uh, again uh, how we used uh, read and write functions to operate on a named uh, pipe. Similarly we could use uh, same read and write functions to operate on unnamed pipes also. But here file descriptors which we are going to pass is already obtained while creating the pipes itself. There is no need for us to explicitly create this FIFOs open this FIFOs or pipes. So let us look at a small code uh, to read and write uh, data from this uh, FIFO. So I am creating a pipe uh, whose descriptors are stored in an array by name DESC. Then I am writing data first to a file descriptor DES of 1. The data to be written is uh, how to read write in pipes. The data is going to be return into a pipe pointed by the descriptor ds of 1 then immediately i am calling a read ds of 0 and i am printing the data whatever i have read so it should print how to read write in pipes again as i said earlier you are within a program if you write and read it's meaningless it's only for learning purpose in reality we need to have different process in case of pipes i should have different dot c file each having its own main few process will write few process will read this is what you have to test in the lab likewise if it is for unnamed pipes yeah we should have parents and child process being created using fork function call between this yeah we could write and read data 
when we use a parent process and child process between them a pipe for communication when we use a pipe between parent and child process yeah, one of them would be performing a, a write operation another fellow would perform a read operation say parent process will write data by using descriptor 1 child process would read data by using descriptor 0 please note here whenever we call fork as we know entire address space gets duplicated for child and will be implemented internally using copy on write feature so whenever you duplicate there exist two copies for parent you're going to have read and write and for child process also you will be having read and write file descriptors when we duplicate file descriptors also will be duplicated parent will have its own file descriptors child process will have its own file descriptors so in this case in the parent process I have decided I am going to perform only write operation then there is no need for a read file descriptor so in the parent process let us close read file descriptors likewise in the child process I have decided I am going to only read so there is no need for a write file descriptor in the child process so in child let me close the write file descriptor so what will happen if I don't close if you don't close uh, nothing will happen with respect to your program is concerned your program will still behave as it is the only th problem is in a given operating system there exists a limitation in the number of file descriptors which can be kept open at the same time so if you don't close if the limits gets crossed there exists problem in opening the files later on so let's always close unwanted file descriptors so what if you want to have a two-way communication I want child process also to write data after a certain time I want child also to write I want parent process to read I want a bi-directional communication using a pipe yet still it's possible we can make a parent process to read as well as write and even child process also to write and read as well but the problem here is if you don't synchronize the parent and child process properly it may so happen that parent will write parent might read back the same data what it has read parent writes child should read child writes parent should read so whenever a particular process writes we want another process to read when parent writes we want child to read when child writes we want parent to read so this is not synchronized automatically if you wish you need to manually synchronize them we can either think of synchronizing explicitly otherwise we can think of creating two pipes pipe one pipe two pipe one I am going to use to write data from parent read it from child pipe two I am going to use where child will write parent will read so in that way you know, we can be explicitly sure that whatever data parent writes child only will read whatever child writes parent only will read now, whichever is convenient for you you could use it yeah I prefer you to practice both in the lab you synchronize it by giving delay using single pipe implement bi-directional communication In the same way I want you to create uh, two pipes and implement bi-directional communication between two or more child process let us look at a small code the same piece of code which I used earlier I am using again here I am creating a pipe where descriptors are stored in DSP of 0 DSP of 1 then I am calling a fork as we know at this position 
a child process gets created. So I'm checking for the condition. If PID is a zero, it's a child process. In the child, I want to read. So I'm closing the write file descriptor. I call a read. The data is not available. Automatically, child process will go into blocked state, pending state. The control gets uh, now transferred into parent process. In parent, we are going to perform a write. So we are closing the read file descriptor. So we are writing some data, whatever is stored in the array by name message. And it's the end of my parent process. So at this time, child process becomes orphan. The child process gets the chance for execution. He will read and print the data. Until this duration, for this orphan process, parent process will be init process. Likewise, we could do reverse operation. We could uh, write in the child, read from the parent. Or we could, as I said, you are in the lab, I am looking at you to implement bidirectional communication. So, to just uh, summarize what we have learned so far, pipes are easy to implement and uh, can be used to connect a data transfer between two or more running processes. We could use uh, pipes, named pipes and unnamed pipes for either establishing communication between related pipes or unrelated processes. We could use uh, pipes to establish communication between related process, whereas FIFOs could be used between related or unrelated, but usually used between unrelated processes. So here to operate on the surf pipes, we use the uh, same uh, file operation function calls. There is no need of any specialized uh, function calls to operate on this pipes. Coming to uh, drawbacks of using the pipes, if we don't have any synchronization mechanism, we have to explicitly synchronize the processes operating on this pipes. And these pipes are going to exist only as long as the open file descriptors are existing. Once we close the file descriptors, pipe will automatically be destroyed. So it's not persistent. You will not be able to run this, uh, use the data preserved in the pipe between reboots or uh, between exit and launch of an application. So how do we overcome this? So in your application or in your project, if you are not looking at uh, these two things, if you don't want synchronization, if you don't want data to be existing, between exit and launch of an application, you can think of using these pipes. When your project demands synchronization or your project demands between exit and launch of an application, data to be persistent or I should be able to close and open the buffer whenever I wish. In such cases, pipes are not desirable. In such cases or in such scenarios, we can think of using this message queues. Message queues are alternatives for pipes. Again, uh, message queues are very easy to implement and are efficient. Message queues can be used uh, between related as well as unrelated process. Message queues can be used between two or more related as well as unrelated processes. Here we send a block of data at a time into this particular message queue. This block of data are basically called as messages. Message queue 
comes along with a inbuilt uh, support for synchronization. Whenever you read a message from a pipe or from a message queue, it will be deleted from the queue. So here, when we implement a message queue, we are creating a queue which can hold few messages. So we can have few set of messages. Whatever message we want, we could write it. The total size of this uh, message queue is going to be of maximum 8K. 8K is the maximum size of the message queue what we could have. And within this message queue, we are going to have a list of messages. The message, whatever we are writing, consists of at least uh, two parts. The message queue or the message what we write here consists of two parts namely the message number and the actual message. The actual message what we are writing here could be a simple variable or could be an array of message or could be a structure or whatever data we want we could write. The message is user defined message. Whatever data we want we could have. The number, whatever we are talking about is basically referred as message type number which usually holds what type of message is this. This number could be used for different purposes. The number here could signify the priority of the message. The number here could signify the idea of the process who should read this message. The message number here could signify a category of message. What is the importance of this number is again left to the user. User can define the importance of using this message number. So number should be of type uh, long int whereas message could be of any data type. If it is any other data type, yeah we have one data type of long int that's a uh, number the message could be of any type. So we have dissimilar data types. As we know, dissimilar data types are grouped using structures. So the message what we are writing here, this message what we are writing here should be implemented internally or by the users using a structure. So we should write one structure called as message structure which will have the first member as long int data type. The name could be any name. That variable is going to hold the message number, message type number. The second part of the message is going to be data which could be of any data type. A number of variables could be declared. Usually we declare one character array which holds the message. Otherwise data could be anything. It's basically message data part. So let us uh, look at some of the system calls related to message queue. In fact, uh, there exist uh, four different uh, system calls like we need to create the message queue we need to delete the message queue. We should be able to perform a write operation on the message queue and perform read operations. So four different uh, operations is what we expect uh, to be there on the message queue. So we have uh, four different uh, system call. Let us take up uh, one by one. First of all, let's have a look at msg get which is used to create a message queue if it doesn't exist or obtain the ID of the existing message queue. The first argument is a key number. Key number, uh, whatever number you wish you could specify. These numbers are used to refer to the message queue or existing message queue or same message queue inside different programs. So I'm giving the key number as a 10. So I know in process one, I'm creating a message queue with number 10. In process 2, I can open the same message queue by giving the key number as 10. So key number 
is used to refer to the message Q across different process. Key number should be unique. We cannot have two message queues with same number. It's going to be uniquely referred. The second argument is a flag. Flag could be one of these two. IPC underscore create. If I use IPC underscore create as a flag, it will create the message queue. If it is a not present, if it is a present, it will return the ID of existing message queue. If you use a flag as IPC create, it will create a message queue and return the ID if it is not present. In case, if it's already created, it just returns the ID of existing message queue. In case, if you add a flag called as IPC Excel, means exclusively create. It means create the message queue if it is not present and return the ID. In case, in case, if the message queue is already there, it will return error. So if you want to make sure the message queue is created by your code only, you need to prefix this flag. You need to add this flag. If you want to use the message queue, if it is already present, or if it is not present, if you want to create, don't add exclusive flag. Just give IPC underscore CREAT. Likewise, as we said earlier, message queues could be used between related and or unrelated process. If you want to use a message queue within a program between only the related process, you could use a, a key number as IPC flag. So IPC underscore private. It is not the flag. It's a key. Key could be IPC underscore private, which means this message queue, what you are creating here, is private to this program only. This process only. If a creation of message queue is successful, it returns you an integer number which is referred as the message queue ID. Once the message queue is uh, created, we need to write data into the message queue or read data from the message queue. Any one of these two operations. Let's first have a look at how do we write uh, data into the message queue. To write or read, we need a, a message structure. As we said, the message what we write into message queue consists of two parts. The first part is the message number. Second part is the message data. So the message uh, number is going to be of type long int. The message data could be of any data type. So we have dissimilar data type. To group them, we make use of a structure. Structure name, variable names could be your own choice. Usually we give the message type number variable name as m type and data as usually m data or m text saying that it is a message data and message type number. To write uh, data into the message queue, we use a function called as msg send. I want to send a message into a message queue whose ID is this. The message what I want to send is present at this address. This is going to be the address of the structure which contains the message what you want to pass. The third argument is the size of the message what you want to send. So I am sending some message into this message queue whose ID is the first argument. The second argument holds the data what you want to send, the message what you want to send. The third argument is the size. Here. First argument is destination, second argument is the source, a third argument is number of bytes to be copied. We want to copy a message from the source to this destination and it is of size 
and bytes. So we have some flags, like I could pass this uh, argument as 0. In such case, if the process is able to write the message into message queue, it will write. That is, if it is having enough space, it will write. In case, if the message queue is full, there is no space to write. In such cases, the process by default will be put into pending state. In case, if you don't want the process to become pending, I have a very important operation to be done later on. I don't want to wait. If I'm able to write, I would like to write. If I'm unable to write, I don't want to wait. In such cases, we could use a flag called as IPC underscore no wait. If flag used here is IPC underscore no wait, then the process will write if there is a space to write. Otherwise, the message will be discarded. So return value indicates the actual number of bytes being written. So it will return a negative value if it fails to write the message into the message queue. Likewise, uh, if you want to read data from the message queue, we have to again have the object of the same structure, which is going to hold the memory buffer where the read message need to be stored. So same structure need to be used for receiving purpose. To receive, we use a function called as a msdrcv system call to read data from which message queue. I'm giving the message queue ID from where the message need to be read. After reading the message, where should I store the read message? Pass the message pointer address where the message need to be stored after reading it. The third argument is the size of the message where how many bytes of the message need to be actually stored. A third, a fourth argument is the message uh, type number and fifth argument is the flag. So here type number and flag plays a very important role. Let's have a look at the meaning of M type number in reading the message. So I have a message queue here which is having a lot of messages. So I have one message with number 1 another message with number 2, another message with number 1, another message with uh, 3, another message with uh, 3, another message with 1. Like this, we are going to have uh, a huge number of messages. Now I want to read. Read which message? So I want to read uh, which message is decided based on the message type number. If in case you pass message type number as a 0, then the first message in the queue will be read which means it will read this message whose number is 1. This message will be read. In case if you pass a number greater than 0, say for example I specified here a number 2. In that case the first message on the queue of the type whatever you have specified will be read. For example, if I pass this as a 2, it will read this message. If I pass this number as a 3, there are two messages with number 3. Among these two, whichever number, whichever message has come first, that message will be read. What if I give here 4? There is no message with that number. The process will now wait until it gets a message whose number is 4, whose message number is 4. So by using this logic, we can send a message to a particular process. We can send uh, this process should read a message only if message number is x. So by we following this principle, we will be able to send message to appropriate process. Likewise, what if I give a number less than 0? Say I give a number minus 5 then it will read the first message on the queue with the message type number which is less than or equal to 
absolute value of the type specified. Absolute value of this is 5. Then it will read a message whose number is less than or equal to 5. It could read any message whose number is less than 5. It means it can read a 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. In this case, it would read the first message itself. We have a flag called as MSG accept. If you add this accept flag as a fifth argument, it would read a message other than what it satisfies. So for example, I gave here a 3 and I use a flag called as MSG accept. It means read a message whose number is other than 3. Other than 3, whatever message is present first, read that message. That's what uh, flag msg underscore accept says. Uh, IPC underscore novate, it has got the same meaning what we had seen earlier for msg send. Same meaning is going to be applied for this flag also, for this function also. Use a msg underscore no error flag. When you use this, the message will be truncated. If the message is longer than the specified number of bytes. I have asked him to read 10 bytes but the message is of 20 bytes. In such case, the message will be cut shorted while reading. Otherwise, it returns error. So whenever you are performing a, a write operation, internally, the ID of the process who is performing a write operation will be stored in a variable called as msg underscore lrpid and msg underscore qnum will be incremented. The time when the message was written will be stored in this structure. So whenever we are reading a message, we can get to know who wrote this message when the message was written. Likewise, whenever a process uh, reads a message, the ID of the process who is reading will be stored in LRPID, the number msg underscore qnum will be decremented by 1 and the time when the message was read is stored in a variable by name msg underscore r time variable of a structure. So how do I retrieve this uh, structure information? To retrieve the structure information or modify the structure information, we make use of some control function called as msg ctl function, message queue control function. Here we pass uh, three arguments, the id of the message queue where you want to operate. The second argument is the command, what command you want to perform. And third argument is based on the command what you are giving where we pass a structure object called as a pointer to structure of type msqid underscore ds data structure of the message queue whose id is passed as an argument. msqid we got as a return value of create same id command could be one of these three ipc underscore stat IPC underscore set, IPC underscore RMID. IPC underscore stand, if you pass as a command, you are requesting the operating system to get the statistics of the IPC whose ID is passed as an argument. If you pass the ID, yeah, that points to some message queue. For that message queue, I want a statistics. All the details what OS is preserving. So this information need to be retrieved and should be stored in the structure pointer passed as third argument. It will give you informations like the user id, group id, permission, how many bytes are there in the message queue, etc. Likewise, you also have a possibility of changing these informations. To change uh, these informations, the command should be ipc set where you can set the values for all this structure. msqid underscore ds. Initialize an object of this structure and then set the values to all its members. 
when you use command as a set now it will set the values whatever you have initialized in the structure pointer will be updated in the kernel stat is used to read kernel information into user structure pointer set is used to take the values from the user structure pointer into the kernel's pointer ipc underscore rmid is used to remove the message queue from your system and all its data structure so if any process is waiting for the message queue on the message queue then that particular process will no more wait if anybody has written any message into the message queue if you delete all those messages are going to be lost so when you delete a message queue the messages are lost any process waiting for read or write operation will no more wait this is the structure msqid underscore ds where you have user id group id mode and etc some more this is a partial structure let us look at a small sample programs so here i have a, each file what i'm showing now each program what i'm storing now could be a different program let us assume this is 1.c which will create a message queue whose number is uh, 10 and i have used a flag ipc create which means create a message queue whose number is 10 if message queue is already present it will return the id otherwise it will create and then return the id i'm just displaying the message whether it has got created successfully or not then i'm passing a ipcs command to system function ipcs is going to give you the status of various ipcs so in the list i should see a message queue being created with key number as 10 Now I have a different program which will write data into the message queue. Say it is a 2.c. Here I have a structure by name message which has a two members. One member of type uh, long end which holds the type of the message. The second member m data which holds the actual data. Once again I am calling a msg get. Now already message queue is created. So it will return the ID of that existing message queue. Then I am initializing the members of the structure. I am setting M type as 1. I am writing a message called as hello into MSG, sorry, M data member of this structure. Then I am calling a MSG send, which is used to send the message into message queue whose ID is this address of the source uh, pointer the size of the message and flags so if I, now again i'm calling ipcs which gives me the ipc statistics if you observe the statistics there it shows you how many message actually got returned what is the total size of the message being consumed it shows the details once again i'm writing one more message once again i'm printing the statistics now it should show me there are two messages of so and so size. So you should understand what will be the each information printed on this IPCS function call. It's a shell command. IPCS is a shell command which gives the statistics of various IPCs. Likewise, uh, to read a message from the message queue, I have used the same structure. I am obtaining the ID of the existing message queue that I am calling a MSG receive. From where to read? After reading, where do I store? The size of the message to be stored. And I have given here M type as 1. Which means it should read a message whose M type number is 1. That is what I have stored while writing. So it will uh, read the message whatever was uh, stored by this program hello is stored in this program so this program will read hello and print 
and again I'm calling IPCS. Now it should show the updated result saying that uh, only one more message is present in the message queue. In the earlier program we wrote two message. Here we are reading one message out. So only one more message is left out in the message queue. So as we said, uh, MSD CTL is used to perform some control operations. So here I am using a flag called as IPC underscore RMID which does the job of deleting the message queue. So earlier we have a return to message, read one message, one more message is left out. It's remaining. Now when I call this, the message queue is deleted even though there is one message in the queue. When I call IPCS, it shows where I can see that the message queue is not getting listed there. The message queue is deleted from your system. You can also use this uh, message queue between related process. Same structure I have taken. I have obtained the message queue once again. I'm calling fork. So I have child process now and parent process. If PID equal to equal to zero, which means it is a child process. I have set M type as one, message as hello. I am sending it using same function call. I am calling IPCS. It shows me now there is one message in the message queue. In the parent process, I am reading the data from the message queue whose M type number is one. And I am printing it. It should print hello. Once again, when I call IPCS, message queue is still existing, but it has zero messages inside it. So here, uh, one more program. I have taken a message queue. I uh, obtained the message queue using MSG get. Once again, I have used the same structure. In the loop, I am writing multiple messages. I'm asking the user to enter different strings. Whatever user enters, that message is stored in the structure. I'm sending it. So for three messages, I'm going to accept three messages I'm sending. I'm, after that, I'm immediately reading the message also for three number of times. And I'm printing whatever message I have received. At last, I'm removing the message queue. Within a single program, we can perform this operation. So if I run the code, your yeah, sender might write uh, three messages with M type as a uh, one, two and three, where I have written a message, hi, welcome to ISM. So it would uh, print accordingly, hi, welcome and ISM. Fine. I hope uh, you have understood all the operations of pipes and message queues. Now let us uh, look into how do we run all those things on the system practically. Let's practically have a look at how do we run these sample codes and also understand uh, various things which gets displayed when we call IPCS function call. After that in the next uh, session let's continue our discussion on some more IPCs uh, like shared memories and semaphores.